All righty, everybody. I just got the okay to start our planetarium show, so I'm going to put away our space trivia questions because now we're going to be heading into the unknown. Ooh. And uh, once again, everybody, welcome, welcome to the Morrison Planetarium. Really quickly, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Christian. I want to be your planetarium presenter. And just a heads up, folks, I'm not just a voice coming out of the walls. I'm actually a person, and I'm standing right behind you. Hey, what's up, y'all? <laughs> Don't hurt your necks. Look forward into the dome before you. That's where the whole show is going to be. I just want to let you know that I'm here, and now I'm an actual person, and I'm going to be your space pilot in a sense. And uh, everything that you see in purple right now is going to be one enormous screen, thanks to the help of six different projectors hiding throughout our planetarium dome. If we're looking for those projectors, they're hidden just below that purple glow. And also, folks, I'm very excited for y'all to be here with me right now because we are doing my absolute favorite show called Tour of the Universe. And with Tour of the Universe, this show is completely live. You're going to hear my voice for the next 30 minutes. And uh, pretty much what we're going to be doing, we're going to be starting off pretty close to the Earth, and we're going to be zooming all the way out to the very edge of the observable universe. Hopefully by the end of the show, you won't have an existential crisis of where we are in space. But I do need to forewarn you, we are quite small in the grand scheme of things. So just a heads up. And uh, before we get started with our show, I do have to go over some quick house rules just so that we're all on the same page. We have a great experience in planetarium. There's quite a few of us in here right now. Uh, first off, there's no food or drinks allowed inside. If you manage to bring any snacks, make sure those are put away to the end of the show. We want to keep the theater nice and clean. Um, also, if you happen to have any cell phones, smartwatches, tablets, anything that produces really bright white light or loud sound, now is the perfect time to turn them off, put them away for the next 30 minutes, as these can be very distracting, not only for you, but for the folks sitting behind you. really takes away from the planetarium show because this room's going to get quite dark. And also, folks, if you need to leave early during our show, you're more than welcome to do so. All we ask is that you exit the very top of the planetarium. That's where you're going to find the exits before, during, and after the show, at the very top of the planetarium. But if you have trouble climbing the stairs, don't worry. Once the show's over, we'll have someone escort you to a lower exit once the show's finished up, so just hang out for a little bit. And last but not least, folks, this show is very immersive thanks to our 75-foot dome above us. If at any point during the show you start to feel overwhelmed, you start to experience motion sensitivity, well, there's a really quick and easy trick to ground yourself. All you got to do is close your eyes, take a few big deep breaths, and your brain will remember that you're sitting in a planetarium in San Francisco and not hurtling across the universe, at least not more than the usual. Hee hee hee. And uh, with that, it looks like we're ready to go. So I invite y'all to sit back, relax, and let's begin our tour of the universe. All righty, everybody. So we're up here in space, and we're starting off pretty close to the Earth. We can see the city lights popping up just down below. Right underneath is spacecraft. And uh, again, as I mentioned, we're starting off, off a little bit above our planet Earth at this really cool thing called the International Space Station, or the ISS for short. And a lot of people tend to ask me, hey, Christian, what is the International Space Station? I hear about it all the time in news and articles, but I don't really know what it is. Could you explain it for me? Well, of course, folks, that's what I'm here for. The International Space Station is a research facility, a laboratory that orbits around our planet Earth. And this came to be because a bunch of countries all around the globe came together to create this spacecraft bit by bit. And they conduct all sorts of science experiments um, up here at the International Space Station. Some of them are things like, ooh, what happens when you try to grow plants in space? Do the plants grow the same? Do they grow differently? Where do their roots go? Because normally they go towards the center of gravity. So what do they do out here in space? Another thing might be, ooh, what happens when you try to spark a match in space? Does the flame act the same? Does that act differently with less gravity? And one of my other favorites is where they had two identical twins. One uh, twin lived on Earth for about a year. The other one lived on the International State Space Station for a year. After that year, they compare and contrasted. Turns out when you live in space for a long period of time, you tend to age a little bit slower. But not only that, you also lose a lot of muscle because you don't have gravity constantly working down on your body all the time to uh, help build those muscles. So if you plan to live in space for a long period of time, remember to exercise daily. Hee <laughs> hee. And also, folks, the International Space Station looks enormous on our screen right now, but it's not that big in actuality. It's only about the size of an American football field. If you've never been to an American football game, don't worry. You can also use the entire California Academy of Sciences, the museum that we're in right now. That's about how big it is. And also what's amazing is that this thing is going incredibly fast, folks. The International Space Station is traveling at a whopping 17,000 miles per hour, where it orbits once around the Earth every 90 minutes where it experiences 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day. Whew, 
how romantic. <laughs> and also, we look really far away from our planet Earth, but we're not too far um, away from the planet. We're only about 225 miles above the surface of the Earth. 225 miles, that's like going from San Francisco to Santa Barbara, a nice little road trip to get away with the family for the weekend, so not too bad. But to tell you the truth, folks, this is as far as we put humans into space nowadays because traveling into space is ooh, very expensive. You got to build yourself a space uh, or spaceship or uh, buy yourself one. And then you get to account for a lot, a lot of rocket fuel. You're going to need a lot of fuel to get all the way out, leave our uh, Earth's gravity and get into space. And then once you accomplish that, you get to account for all the food, water and all the air you're going to be breathing while you're up here in space. So the bill gets quite costly quite rapidly. So, folks, the International Space Station is just the first stop on our tour of the universe, so let's leave it behind, shall we? We're going to see it slowly disappear down to the Earth below and to the city lights as well. And before we lose track of the International Space Station, I want to add a nice little orbital path so we can keep track of it as we start to zoom away. Alrighty, everybody, we zoom so far away now that we're looking down at our entire planet Earth. And uh, just to let you know, folks, the space program that I'm using here right now is something um, that you can go home and download if you want to fly through space just like how I am. The space program that I'm using here in the planetarium is something called Open Space. So if you go to your favorite search engine, type in Open Space Project, you'll come across the link where you can download this and you can fly through space just like how I am. But just a heads up. Open space is not completely finished. Uh, it's in its beta phase, which means that we may come across a few bugs and glitches here and there. If we do, I'll point them out for you. Hopefully we can look past them. And also just to let you know, open space uses a whole lot of processing power. So if you have an older computer, I wouldn't recommend it. It may overwhelm that computer, but if you've got something new or a gaming computer, give it a try. It's a whole lot of fun. And also if you're a person like me that doesn't want to download anything, um, we also have another great alternative called NASA's Eyes. Just like the human eyeball, just type in NASA's eyes into your favorite search engine, and then you don't have to download anything. You can fly through space just like how I am, and it's so much fun. But let's leave our planet Earth behind, because now we're going to be making our way over to our nearest natural neighbor to us in space, the moon. Alrighty, folks, we're making our way over to the moon, and uh, we humans have been to the moon before, but that was between 1969 and 1972, thanks to NASA's six Apollo space missions that brought a total of 12 incredibly lucky guys to walk on the surface of the moon, conduct science, and of course, they had some fun as well. They got to play some golf up here as well. But uh, luckily, we're inside a planetarium, so I have some special abilities. I'm going to turn off the nighttime on the moon. Hey, that's the moon I'm familiar with. Looking good. And uh, folks... Again, last time we sent humans to the moon was 1972, a little more than 50 years ago or so. But don't worry, we humans are planning a return trip back to planet Earth, or planet, back to the moon, uh, thanks to NASA's new space mission called Artemis. Pretty much, uh, NASA wants to send humans to Mars, but before we send humans deep into our solar system, we got to figure out exactly how we're going to live out here in space. So the moon is the perfect stepping stone to figuring out the logistics of how we're going to be doing that. And uh, also, our technology has improved greatly in the last 50 years, so we're able to conduct a lot more science in a much more compactable size, so we can bring a lot more equipment with us uh, than before. And what's also really great is that uh, NASA is going to be sending the first woman to the moon, but not only that, they're also going to be sending the first person of color to the moon, but not only that, they're also going to be setting up lunar bases throughout the moon with that Artemis mission. Pretty much, again, we want to um, conduct science that we weren't able to do uh, 50 years ago. So now is a great time. And one great place of interest is the south pole of the moon. Uh, we found evidence of ice there, and ice can be very useful if you want to set up bases all the way out here. So very beneficial for us. And uh, maybe we'll set up lunar bases throughout the moon in different areas that we haven't uh, explored before. And what's also really neat is that they're going to have a space station that's going to be orbiting around the moon at all times, kind of like the International Space Station that we just saw. So if anything was to go wrong while these astronauts were on the surface, they can launch off and head to that space station where they would be safe. So again, we humans should be heading back to the moon in the next few years. Cross my fingers. Hopefully everything goes according to plan. So look out for any news about Artemis in the coming years, y'all. 
And also, folks, when we look at the moon here from Earth, especially when it's close to the horizon, sometimes the moon feels incredibly close to us. Sometimes it feels like you can reach out your arms and touch it. But the moon is incredibly far away. It's roughly about 240,000 miles away from the Earth. Whew, 240,000 miles. Some of the adults in this room may have a car with that many miles on it. And if you take better care of your car than I do, you can even imagine driving to the moon if you drove for four months nonstop going about 80 miles per hour. Although I wouldn't recommend it, the roads out here are poorly maintained. He he he. And uh, from here on now, folks, we're going to need to use a more useful measuring stick because at this scale, using miles is kind of like using inches to describe the distances between cities because space is so big. So astronomers use a more convenient measurement known as light speed. And light travels at a mind-boggling speed of 187,000 miles per second. That's roughly 300,000 kilometers per second. So while it took the astronauts more than three days to reach the moon, traveling faster and farther than any human has done so or since, it only takes light one and a half seconds to cross that distance at the speed of light. That's kind of like a short pause in conversation. But at last, folks, it's time for us to leave the moon behind. So for now, everybody say bye-bye, moon. See you later. Oh, oh he's so cute. <laughs> And now, folks, we're going to be stepping into a much larger realm of our solar system because now we're going to watch the moon and the Earth and their orbits as they slowly disappear. In fact, before we lose track of them, I want to add some nice little planet trails so we can keep track. You can easily lose stuff out here in outer space. And, folks, on our journey, we're going to be traveling much faster than the speed of light. We're going to be traveling at the speed of the human imagination thanks to the help of computer models like Open Space showing us the most accurate images and information available to us. And just any second now, the nearest star to us, the sun, should be coming into view. So uh, here comes the sun. Do, 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 do. And also, folks, the sun is incredibly far away from us. The sun's about 93 million miles away from the Earth. So we're the third rock from the sun. One, two, three. 93 million miles between us. In order for sunlight to travel that 93 million miles, it takes sunlight about eight and a half minutes to reach all the way to planet Earth. So uh, not too bad in terms of sunlight speed, speed of light. But now that we have a nice bird's eye perspective of our solar system, uh, let's get a quick crash course of what's inside of it. There's quite a bit of stuff here in our solar system. Right in the middle, uh, we have our star, the sun, the biggest thing. The closest planet to the sun, we've got Mercury. Then we have Venus, Earth, Mars. These are the rocky terrestrial planets. These are places where we can actually land a spacecraft on. And then past the orbit of Mars, we have that uh, really fancy thing called the main asteroid belt. And this is what it would look like if we highlight all the asteroids in our asteroid belt. There is a lot of them. Give it a second to load up. So those are all the asteroids. And then past the main asteroid belt, we have the really big planets, the gas giants, the Jovians. We got the biggest of them all. We got Jupiter. Then we have Saturn. And then after them, we have our icy gas giants. We have Uranus, the funny one, and Neptune. And of course, of course, we can add everyone's favorite and lovable dwarf planet, Pluto. So here's the orbit of Pluto coming onto the screen, just down to the left right there. And right now, folks, I'm going to be adding on screen some of the many different spacecrafts that we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system. So coming on screen right now are going to be the trajectories of Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, and Voyager 2, and the latest of them all, New Horizons, which did a quick flyby of Pluto in uh, 2015, so not too long ago. And just to let you know, folks, all these spacecrafts are traveling fast enough to escape the sun's gravity and leave our solar system behind. But even the most distant of these robot adventures, Voyager 1, has not traveled as far as light travels in a single day. In order for sunlight to travel all the way out to the orbit of Pluto, it takes sunlight about five hours at the speed of light to get this far. Only five hours. Again, not too bad. But folks, let's leave our planetary scale behind us because now we're going to be heading out into interstellar space, the space between the stars. Distance now becomes so immense, it's going to take us over four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us, the Alpha Centauri system.
And I think we just flew by Alpha Centauri. Yep, that was it. So Alpha Centauri is going to be on the right hand, the closest star to us. We're right uh, in the middle. So again, four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us. But that doesn't really put into perspective of how long it would take us humans to travel that distance. Well, folks, if you're getting in a rocket ship today, left planet Earth, make your way over to Alpha Centauri. It's going to take you about 8,500 years to cross that distance. Whew. And that's just a one-way trip. But folks, let's stop and consider whether humanity has made its presence known beyond our solar system, because now we're going to be stepping inside something called the radiosphere. So again, we are now inside the radiosphere, and this represents the current limits of the most distant radio signals humanity has ever broadcasted or rather leaked into space. And it extends about 90 light years in all directions emitting out from the Earth and first began in the early 1930s with strong radio waves, early television, radar signal, and then later the detonation of atomic weapons. All this stuff is emitting electromagnetic radiation strong enough to escape the Earth's ionosphere. And humans were broadcasting well before that, but the earliest radio was not quite powerful enough to escape the, uh, escape the Earth. And since all these signals are electromagnetic, they are traveling at the speed of light, so this is kind of like humanity's electromagnetic footprint in the universe. And of course, the radio sphere is always expanding at the rate of one light year per year. So is anybody out there listening? And right now, folks, I'm going to be adding some markers onto our screen. These markers are going to represent some of the many thousands of stars astronomers have discovered over the last 30 years, which has at least one or more planets orbiting around them. We call them exoplanets, and we're looking for any of them that are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it. So far today, we found 5,000 confirmed exoplanets just in the nearby vicinity to us, and that 5,000 number is going to be increasing as the years continue, because we have space telescopes where their whole purpose is to find as many exoplanets as possible. So that 5,000 is going to be going up. But if any, um, to answer the question, if any of them are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it, well, we can't answer that question quite yet. Pretty much new space telescopes are being developed right now, so it's going to be uh, quite a while before those are created and then launched into space and conducting science. So we got a little while before we can answer that question. But the more important point here is that quite a few of these planetary systems are within that 90 light year limit of our radio sphere and could have potentially received our signals. However, since radio waves travel at the speed of light, if there is anybody that's out there able to listen in and answer back, the communication delays between hellos could be decades in time. Now, to give you an example, let's say we live in a star system all the way over here on the left-hand side. We find an alien civilization somewhere towards the middle on the right-hand side. We shoot them a text message. We say, hey, we live over here. Take 60 years to get to them. They listen in, answer back another 60 years to get to us. That is a 120-year conversation in the making. Whew, and I can barely wait for a text message from my friend. <laughs> But of course, folks, planetary systems beyond the radio sphere, more than 90 light years away from us, have not heard from us yet. But eventually they will, as the radio sphere is always growing, but it becomes weaker as it does. And for now, I'm going to be putting away our exoplanet markers, because that's just a whole lot. But I'm going to leave our radio sphere up on screen, because as huge as humanity's electromagnetic footprint is, it is nothing compared to our Milky Way galaxy. Alrighty, folks, we're looking down at our Milky Way galaxy, and uh, can anybody see their house from here? <laughs> Just kidding. And folks, our Milky Way galaxy is incredibly large. If you wanted to cross it from one side to the other, it's going to take you about 130,000 years at the speed of light just to cross it one way, so quite large. And not only that, our Milky Way galaxy is so huge, we estimate that there's at least 300 billion stars in our galaxy alone. If a recent discovery of so many exoplanets just within this small neighborhood within this vast star city is any indication, there could be billions of planets and potentially millions of Earth-like planets throughout our single galaxy. And before we leave our Milky Way galaxy, I want to show you what it looks like from a sideways perspective. When we look at the Milky Way from a sideways, you're going to notice that it looks like a big flat pancake. And this is going to come important later on the show. And you probably heard someone say, hey, look, you can see the Milky Way when you look up in the night sky. What they're referring to is this, the plane of the Milky Way. That's what you're seeing up in the night sky. 
And again, this is important because when astronomers and scientists want to learn about the universe, it's a lot more easier for them to point their telescopes galactically north and galactically south instead of looking through the plane of the Milky Way, which has planets, stars, gas, debris, things that block their view of the universe. So keep that in mind. We like to point our telescopes galactically north and south. But folks, the Milky Way galaxy is only one of many hundreds of billions of galaxies that comprise the known universe. So in this giant leap, every single point of light that you now see no longer represents a star, but rather the location of an individual galaxy. Each galaxy containing hundreds of billions, perhaps trillions of stars. Now, we live in a local galaxy group which contains about 30 galaxies, large and small. Also includes the nearest large spiral to us, the Andromeda Galaxy, only 2 million light years away, just next door, and heading right for us. We're going to get to know it pretty intimately in about 5 billion years, so mark your calendars. And also, folks, as we continue zooming out, you're now going to realize that galaxies are not evenly distributed throughout space. Instead, galaxies like to clump together in large groups and clusters, or they like to avoid each other where there's very few galaxies or no galaxies at all. So we can see a nice galaxy cluster off towards the middle right over here. We can see some galaxy clusters a little bit down below. We can see very few galaxies towards the top left or no galaxies at all. So you can kind of think of galaxies like people. They like to hang out together or they like to avoid each other. Hee <laughs> hee. And also, folks, we've zoomed so far out now that the picture that we're looking at represents the closest 30,000 galaxies to us over a space over 300 million light years across. We've got to give thanks to an amazing astronomy crew uh, led by Dr. Brent Tully at the University of Hawaii, who compiled this amazing representation uh, alongside uh, dozens of other astronomers over decades of time. So big shout out to Dr. Brent Tully. I love flying through this galactic map. A whole lot of fun. But now, folks, we have automated systems that are mapping even the most distant galaxies. Folks, we're about to see the very large-scale structure of the universe. And remember, folks, every single point of light that you're seeing, that's not a star. That's an individual galaxy. Whew, I feel small. And also, just to let you know, the large-scale structure of the universe is not shaped like a bow tie or a butterfly as we start to swing around. In fact, let's swing on around a little bit more. There we go. Uh, the reason why we're seeing this is because of that Milky Way plane that we talked about not too long ago. If we were to line up our Milky Way galaxy, it would line up just down in the middle like so. So again, we like to point our telescopes galactically north and galactically south instead of looking through the plane of the Milky Way. But scientists still want to make sure that there was galaxies through our Milky Way plane. So we have this nice purple survey right down the middle. Here, you notice that they'll, there were, they were still able to find galaxies, just not as far and not as many. Pretty much we have to wait for our technology to improve. And once that happens, we'll be able to map out all these areas that haven't been filled in yet. So it's just a matter of time. But folks, it looks like we're running drastically low on our tour of the universe. 30 minutes is just not enough time. So let's continue pressing on because now we're going to be encountering these really distant, far away objects known as the quasars. And the quasars are going to be represented by these nice orange dots at the very edge of the large scale. We got some on the left. We got some on the right. And quasars are short for quasi-stellar radio sources. And these blazing objects are all billions of light years away. So now we're looking so far back in the depth of time and space that the most distant quasars represent the universe at a much earlier age. We're nearing the very beginning of galaxy formation. In other words, with the quasars, we're viewing a sort of awkward, gawky teenage version of the universe. And before there was a teenager, there was a baby. So let's press back to a time before quasars, planets, stars, and even galaxies began to form. Folks, we're about to see the very edge of the observable universe. Alrighty, folks, here we are at the very edge of the observable universe, and what we're looking at is something called the Cosmic Microwave Background Image, or the CMB image for short. And all evidence indicates that the universe we live in is about 13.8 billion years old, and this is data compiled by Planck and other radio telescopes. And the picture that we're looking at is the very baby version of the universe, only 380,000 years after the Big Bang occurred, where space and time began. And what we're looking at is not a typical photo either. Instead, this is a temperature density image where the light echoes of the Big Bang are color-coded with the lighter areas corresponding to the hottest, least dense regions and the darker areas, the coolest, densest regions. These fluctuations in temperature and density are extremely tiny. They vary no more than one part per 100,000. But these small differences eventually gave rise to a large-scale structure of the universe that we saw moments ago, that clumping and clustering of galaxies everywhere. 
Figuring out just how that happened is one of the larger challenges for cosmological research today. Though our view here is of the outer edge of the known universe, the earliest light visible to us, that radiation actually persists all around us. It permeates the universe, stretching and cooling as the universe expands over billions of years of time. But folks, we've traveled as far back as the law of physics can physically allow us to go, so we only have one direction left to go, and that's going to be back towards planet Earth. And uh, let's find a nice entry point through all these quasars and galaxies, and let's make a return trip back to planet Earth, y'all. <clears throat> All righty, folks, we're crossing an expanse of 13 billion light years. We present you with this view of our universe and the latest in cosmological and astronomical information. We're covering eons and observing objects billions of light years apart. Now, we live in a golden age of astronomy with new generations of telescopes and spacecrafts that are extending the reaches of our eyes, preparing for the eventual race between the advancement of technology and the accelerating expansion of the universe. And uh, with that thought, I want to remind you all that astronomy is for everyone. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to enjoy the beauties and wonders of the universe. All you need is the night sky, and if you can, get away from the lights of our cities and look up. Even a good pair of binoculars makes for a decent first telescope, and there's astronomy clubs all around the world that invite people just like you to look through their telescopes and peer into the great beyond, allowing you to partake in the wonders that our universe has to offer. Now, astronomy as a hobby can offer an endless supply of satisfaction, and I do hope you'll join us, those who dream amongst the stars. But it looks like we're now entering our Milky Way galaxy, and we're heading straight for that radio sphere. And of course, folks, we are making our way downtown, walking fast, faces passing our homebound. Dun -dun 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 -dun. And we're now approaching our solar system and now about to pass the spacecraft we sent out in the 1970s to explore that solar system, passing the orbit of Pluto and making our way to the third rock from the sun, our homeworld, planet Earth, where all the humans we know and love and ever have existed all lived on this one planet. And we're now about to pass the orbit of the moon, the furthest we've ever sent humans out into outer space. And as we make our final approach back to planet Earth, folks, this is going to be the end of our Tour of the Universe show. And I want to thank you all for stopping by and watching with me today. I hope you did enjoy it. But hey, look at that. We made it back safe and sound. And that's all for now, folks. Thanks for stopping by.